a let me go ahead and give choose the co-host right quick and then i put the pdf in the jumbo chunk i'm pretty confident we can get through this it's there's going to be an introduction of you know what happened in grenada very short couple pages and then as he goes into his speech hello so, motherfucker what's up so let me get this ready mm -mm -mm. Oh, you know what? I should put the expectations in the jumbotron as well. Let me find it. Oh, child. Hey, Ryan. Hey. Okay, I think I got it in the jumbotron. So let's see. Let me pull it up. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump right into it and see. Hold on real quick. Oh, okay, cool. So it starts off, U.S. hands off Grenada. The following is based on an editorial that appeared in the November 4th, 1983 issue of Militant. October 27th, in the first such airborne invasion since Vietnam, nearly 2,000 U.S. Marines and Army Rangers stormed the tiny island of Grenada, October 25th. This naked and unprovoked aggression reveals the hatred of the U.S. ruling class for the example Grenada set in 1979 when it became the first Black country in the world to carry out a socialist revolution. As news of the criminal invasion spread, an outcry was heard around the world. Millions saw it as an ominous prelude to new U.S. military intervention against Nicaragua, Salvadorian liberation fighters, and others struggling for freedom in the region. The invasion of Grenada was preceded by the tragic developments that led to the assassination of Grenadian Prime Minister Maurice Bishop and many other top government leaders. These events have been deeply felt by workers in the United States, especially Blacks. The Grenadian people, like their sisters and brothers in Cuba and Nicaragua, demonstrated that it is possible, even for a tiny, oppressed nation, to throw off the racist, imperialist boot of Washington, to take power from the hands of the capitalists and landlords, and to establish a government that fights for the interests of working people. The U.S. rulers don't want us to know the truth about the gains they are destroying in Grenada. So they now claim Grenada was a terrorist island run by Cubans, not Grenadians, and that it was being built up as a Cuban army base, in quotes, and terrorist training camp, also in quotes, for Havana. But it is Washington that has turned Grenada into a U.S. army base to terrorize the Grenadian people and roll back what they won through their revolution. 6,000 U.S. troops now occupy the Black Island in an outrageous violation of the nation's right to self-determination and independence. What are the gains the Grenadian People Revolution achieved? In 1979, the Grenadians overthrew Eric Gary, a U.S.-backed tyrant, and replaced him with the government of workers and farmers, led by the Jewel Movement. I'm sorry, the New Jewel Movement. That government, headed by Bishop, mobilized the toiling masses for four and a half years to overcome the legacy of poverty, hunger, illiteracy, left by centuries of colonial and capitalist rule. In short, time since 1979, the Grenadian government slashed unemployment from 49% to less than 14%. Thousands of acres of idle land were made available to small farmers for cooperatives. Women were given equal rights and a vast program of healthcare, nutrition, adult education, and literacy classes was organized to transform the lives of the Grenadian people. Democratic councils were established all over the island. The Grenadian government asked for help from the world to accomplish these projects. Washington rejected the appeal, refused aid, and sabotaged Grenada's efforts to get loans from other nations. The Cuban government, in contrast, immediately responded by offering construction workers, doctors, technicians, and other assistance to the struggling, impoverished nation. Washington, meanwhile, stepped up its economic, diplomatic, and military threats against Grenada to try to force its people to back off from their revolution. It was the refusal of the new dual leadership and Grenadian people to retreat from their course and earn them the fear and hatred of U.S. imperialism and the profound admiration of workers all over the world. 
taking advantage of the devastating blow October 19th when Grenadian army officers overthrew the bishop-led New Jewel government. Reagan ordered a U.S. fleet en route to Lebanon to change course and invade Grenada. In the first hours of the invasion, Washington boasted that it was a complete success. This quickly changed as the Grenadian people, aided by Cuban construction workers on the island helping to build a new airport, fought back. By the second day, Secretary of Defense Casper Weinberger had to go on television and admit U.S. troops were meeting a lot more resistance than we expected, in quotes. Another 800 U.S. troops from the 82nd Airborne Division were rushed to Grenada. In the front line of the resistance to the invaders were the heroic Cuban workers. A CBS TV report, October 26, said the U.S. Marines were stopped cold when they attacked the Cubans as the airport site. It took over 1,000 U.S. troops, backed up by aircraft and heavy weaponry, more than a day to overcome fewer than 700 Cubans. At the same time, the U.S. Defense Department said that said there were still pockets of resistance where fighters were holding out against the invasion forces. The Cuban government announced midday October 6, 26, that the Cuban resistance had ended. Earlier, the government explained its decisions on how it would respond to the invasion. On October 25th, President Fidel Castro announced that Grenadian authorities had asked Cuba to send fighters to help repel the impending invasion. According to Radio Havana, the Cuban government responded that it was impossible to, I'm sorry, on this part, this word is a little off, exceed to the request uh, for political and military reasons that were absolutely unfavorable to the organizing of prolonged resistance. At the same time, the radio station reporter Castro said that those, those Cubans in Grenada should remain at their post of work and should defend themselves if attacked by invading forces, despite the chilling, yeah, the chilling of relations between Cuba and Grenada. Radio Havana announced- You ready? Uh, you ready for a break, babe? Uh, we could do it like page by page. So I'll finish okay, it gotcha. quick and then you'll pick up on there. Okay, gotcha. Um, despite the chilling relations between Cuba and Grenada, Radio Havana announced later that day, as the invasion was underway, that the U.S. invaders had taken Cubans hostage and demanded that all other Cubans surrender. The thief, I'm sorry, <laughs> the chief of the Cuban personnel indicated that they would not surrender under any circumstances and that they awaited instructions from their commander in chief, Fidel Castro. The Cuban government wired back immediately. We congratulate your heroic resistance. The Cuban people are proud of you. Do not surrender under any circumstances. The Cubans in Grenada responded, Commander in Chief, we will carry out your orders and we will not surrender. Uh, it's something in Spanish, I'm not gonna kill it. So I'm gonna say it in English, homeland or death. The following morning at a pre-dawn news conference, Castro declared, the valiant Cuban construction workers have written a beautiful page in history and waged a battle for the small countries of the world against imperialist military aggression. They have also fought for the Americas and for their own homeland, as if they're in Grenada, they were defending the first trenches of the liberty and sovereignty of Cuba. Castro also reported that the Cuban government had taken emergency steps prior to the U.S. invasion to prevent it. It had appealed directly to U.S. diplomatic personnel and offered to cooperate in any way possible to safely evacuate North Americans and other non-Grenadians so as to avoid violence and intervention. Washington spurned this proposal for peace and never even reported it to the American people because the U.S. rulers had already decided on their criminal aggression, regardless of the loss of life suffered by U.S. citizens, Grenadians, or Cubans. The staggering military force sent against uh, the 110,000 people of Grenada, including 6,000 U.S. Marines and Army Rangers, backed up by AC-130 airplane gunships, and a dozen warships, including the aircraft carrier Independence, with some 70 com combat planes abroad. In addition, 300 troops have been sent in by the island nations of Barbados, Jamaica, Antigua, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Dominica, and St. Christopher Nevis. Grenada has an army of only 1,200 and a few thousand militia members. The invasion was kept secret from the American people until it was four hours underway. President Reagan, then held a news conference defending the aggression by claiming American lives are at stake, referring to U.S. students at St. George's University School of Medicine in Grenada, that several East Caribbean nations had called on Washington to act and that the United States had to assist. 
in a joint effort to restore order and democracy on the island of Grenada. That was the quote. The idea that this murderous assault had anything to do with protecting the U.S. students was immediately denounced by the chancellor of the medical school himself, Dr. Charles Modica. We was just reading that the U.S. will create any excuse to invade. And one of their favorite excuses is to save American lives. Just wanted to say that that was wild um, to just read that same thing. He reported that prior arrangements have been made within the U.S. State Department and U.S. Canadian authorities to peacefully remove the students. The invasion plans were kept secret from him. If, any were to, if anyone were to hurt the assault, he declared, Reagan, quote unquote, should be held accountable. Modica withdrew his statement a day after the State Department claimed him and ca called him in for a meeting. The quote unquote or, order and democracy U.S. Marines are bringing in the grenade um, bringing the Grenadian people, law and order, said Secretary of State George Schultz, reminds one of the order brought to Black communities in the United States and the rebellions against racist oppression during the 1960s and 1970s. Law and order, quote unquote, <laughs> at point of a bayonet or inflicted by club swinging, trigger happy cops. The fact is, Reagan, in total violation of Grenadian's sovereign right to self-determination, has invaded the island to wipe out working class law and order conquer, um, to wipe out the working class law and order conquered over the past four and a half years by the Grenadian people under the leadership of the New Joel movement. This kind of law and order where the needs and interests of the toiling masses come first, where their rights are enforced against the tiny minority that owns the banks, businesses, and landed estates. When a sharp dispute split the New Jewel movement leadership several weeks ago, culminating in the overthrow of the Bishop-led government and the assassination of central leaders of the revolution, Washington seized on this giant blow to maximize the damage it could do to the revolution in Grenada and worldwide. An international disinformation campaign was swiftly organized to confuse, disarm, and disrupt the workers' movement on a world scale in face of these tragic events quote-unquote, news stories flourished about Bissa being outed by, ousted by hardliners and Marxists because he was allegedly not moving fast enough in the construction of a socialist society. The Cuban and Soviet governments were charged, without a shut of proof, with organizing this anti-Bishop campaign, his murder, and the overthrow of his government. When a new military council declared it was replacing the Bishop-led government, the imperialists tried to portray it as Marxists. The goal was to poison the minds of the working people as to what genuine Marxism stands for. The government and Communist Party of Cuba issued a major statement October 20th answering these lies, setting straight Cuba's role in the Grenada events and clarifying for the world what genuine Marxism communism stands for, explaining that on principle, they had not intervened at all in the Grenada events. And the statement declared that Bishop was among <clears throat> And this is a quote, Bishop was among the political leaders who most enjoyed sympathy and respect among our people. No doctrine, no principle or position held up as revolutionary and no internal division justifies atrocious proceedings like the, phys the physical elimination of Bishop and the outstanding group of honest and worthy leaders killed. That's the end of the quote. The imperialist invasion of Ingr Grenada and the danger of it spreading throughout Central and Caribbean and the Caribbean poses a major challenge to the U.S. labor movement. How should it respond? A criminal example of what not to do was given by the officialdom of the AFL-CIO. On, um, on October 20th, in the wake of the assassination of the bishop, the AFL-CIO released a statement aimed at providing labor cover for Reagan's impending invasion. Shedding crocodile te tears for the slain bishop, the statement then falsely charged his government with the denial of human and trade union rights. That's a quote. It called for the overthrow by military figures a communist purge. It continued, quote, the AFL-CIO calls upon the democratic governments and private institutions of the civilized world to take every possible action to castigate and cond condemn the lawless military regime. Everyone in the labor movement opposed to the U.S. intervention should repudiate this treacherous statement, may not in the interest of the U.S. workers, but U.S. big business and its government. The best way to do so is to join immediately in the protest demanding that the U.S. troops be withdrawn from Grenada. There is a second task of unionists and all opponents of the invasion. 
join the lessons, lessons of the Grenadian Revolution in order to strengthen the working class struggle to take power in the U.S. and around the world. Reagan's Marines and bombers cannot drown in the blood, drown in blood the gigantic impact, could not drown in blood the gigantic impact that the revolution has had within the United States, especially among blacks and on a worldwide scale. Nor can the imperialists erase the enormous contribution of the fallen Grenadian leaders made the process of forging an international Marxist leadership capable of leading a proletariat to power. Getting out the truth, getting out the truth about what the workers and farmers governments government in Grenada has meant, its gains, its challenges, its is faced and the defeats it suffered is vital to deepening the struggle of U.S. workers among the path charted by our sisters and brothers in Grenada. Advancing that fight for socialist revolution in the United States, the fight has already begun by the comrades of Grenada, Nicaragua, and Cuba, is the highest tribute that can be paid to the martyred mutual work leaders, Grenadian workers and farmers, and the Cuban construction workers who have fallen in combat for their goal. Long live the Grenadian revolution, U.S. out of Grenada, bring the troops home now. So real quick, just to overview like what me and Choose just read, right, is that it's showing how a country, again, taking its own self-determination in its hands, overthrowing the capitalists and succeeding in creating a socialist revolution and benefiting the people and improving the material conditions of the people, the U.S. took that as a direct threat and invaded so when people say, oh, socialism doesn't work, look at the country, it's oftentimes you can trace it back to not only intervention, but destabilization by the U.S. because it's a direct threat to capital. So that it was a good, like, just a brief history on what happened. And the next page goes into his speech to the U.S. workers. And so choose on this one. Do you want to keep with the we each do one page and just go back and forth between a page? You mean because, like, there's two pages on one page? Yeah, so they have, on the way it shows up on my PDF, mm -hmm. it has, like, it's split between, like, page, like, there's a page break. So I'll read one page, and then you can read the next. Oh, okay. Cool. All right, so let me close up on this one a little bit. Maurice Bishop speaks to U.S. workers. The following speech by Maurice Bishop, Prime Minister of Grenada, was given June 5th, 1983, to the audience of over 2,500 people at Hunter College in New York City. It was originally printed in the July 15th and 22nd and 29th of 1983 issues of The Militant. The speech has been slightly abridged. Transcription and editorial preparation were done by The Militant. And also real quick, that's why it's so important to learn about resistance struggles and revolutions across the global south because we miss out i know i know a lot of people we do not talk about the grenadian revolution not as much as we should and there's so much we can learn from that so when we we gloss over or erase you know black struggles and black liberations we, we miss out on a lot of things that we can learn and educate ourselves about and replicate and improve upon so i just wanted to highlight that Thank you very much for that very warm welcome, sisters and brothers, comrades, all. May I start out by bringing you to, uh, I'm sorry, may I start out by bringing to you warm fraternal greetings from the free people of Revolutionary Grenada. May I also, right in the very beginning, say how very, very pleasant it is to be back in New York among you and to be in this great hall where there are so many hundreds of our sisters and brothers that is going to bring a great deal of pleasure to our free people and I will certainly report your warmth, your enthusiasm, and your revolutionary support for our process when I return. I would also like to place on the record our deep appreciation for the people responsible in Hunter College for lending us this facility this evening. We are here among friends, but looking around, there are two people here who are right now representing their countries at the United Nations, people who are involved in liberation struggles, who are struggling for freedom, for their peoples. It's very important right at the beginning, sisters and brothers, that we acknowledge the presence of Dr. Sahidi Terizi, the representative to the United Nations of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. The chants in the crowd uh, chant PLO over and over. Dr. Terizi can be assured as always that the people of Palestine and their sole authentic representative, the Palestine, the Palestine Liberation Organization, will always have the fullest support of the fraternal people of Grenada. The crowd applauded. There is another liberation movement whose representative is present among us, 
and this one too has been in the news quite a lot recently. Contrary to what some people have been trying to pretend, that this particular liberation organization is not willing to take the struggle to the highest stage, right in the capital city of the racist apartheid country of South Africa, a bomb went off. Another applause from the crowd. The South African racists who have spent so much time inventing all sorts of ingenious ways of oppressing the people of South Africa, the black majority, are now discovering that in common with all of the national liberation movements around the world, that there are a force to move to the highest stage of the struggle. The African National Congress, ANC, is also willing to make that step. In saluting the Deputy Permanent Representative of the ANC to the United Nations, let us ask him to bring back to his people, to bring back to his organization, to bring back to Oliver Tambo, to Nelson Mandela, whose spirit is here with us, to bring back the love, the respect, the concern, the admiration, and the fraternal feelings of all of us. Brother David Nadaba. The crowd starts chanting ANC over and over. The last time I had the opportunity, sisters and brothers, comrades, of being in New York and addressing our Grenada nationals, other people from the Caribbean and Latin America, and of course the people of the United States, was four years ago. Since those four years have passed, a lot has happened in our country. A lot has happened in the world. And one of the reasons that we have to come to the United States is to share our experience of the last four years with the people of the United States. We were anxious to do this because there has been a major campaign against Grenada over the last several weeks and months, starting from last year in November, with some remarks by the U.S. Vice President in Miami, continuing more remarks from the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and the Admiral of the Fleet. This included the President himself, as you know, on the 10th of March addressing manufacturers on the 23rd of March in the famous or infamous Star Wars speech, the more recently again in the joint session of Congress on the 27th of April. And in all these, different allegations were made against our country. And therefore, we are particularly happy, comrades, to have opportunity of an invitation from Trans Africa, the organization based in Washington that has been doing lobbying for Africa and the Caribbean. We were invited to come to address their sixth annual dinner last night, and that was a very successful event. We want to publicly thank Trans Africa once again for making this visit possible. The Congressional Black Caucus, too, was involved as co-sponsor of this visit, and we also want to place our appreciation for this on the record. And if anyone has any doubts at all about the growing strength of the Black vote and the increasing influence of Afro-Americans in this country, I want to let you know that it is precisely because of the pressures that were brought by our friends in the Black Caucus that a, that a visa was eventually granted for the visit. The crowd applauded. Of course, we set ourselves other objectives for the visit. This included the very important objective of trying to deepen and strengthen the people-to-people -people relations that have always existed between our two countries, Grenada and the United States. At the level of the people, there has never been any problem. We have always had excellent relations with the people of the United States. In fact, in some years, more American tourists come to our country than the entire population of our country. And if we go around and take a careful count, we may well discover that there are more Grenadians living in the United States than the entire, the whole population of Grenada. And on top of that, there are several Americans who reside permanently in our country. And there is a medical school in Grenada where over 700 young Americans are earning their right to become doctors. So from our point of view, clearly, Black relations do not make sense. From our point of view, they need to, the need to ensure that, that even more American visitors come to our country every year is critical and a burning need. And the opportunity, therefore, to speak directly to the people of the United States is a very important opportunity. We also set an objective of trying to make contact with as many sectors and sections of American society as we could during this visit. And to this end, there have been several meetings in the past week with congressmen and other influential people in the society. In the society, We have attempted over this period also to try to talk to as many people from the media as we could reach. That objective has gone well too. Another objective that we had was to use the period to deepen our relations with some of our closest friends in the United States, with our Black American sisters and brothers, with our Grenadian nationals, and the progressive forces right across the United States who have given us so much support unstingingly 
to those who lead and are hard workers in the friendship societies and solidarity committees. We are very anxious to speak to the sisters and brothers to express our appreciation for the hard work that they have done and give them some idea as to what we are doing at this time in Grenada. That objective also has gone well. Another objective was to try yet again to establish some sort, some form of official contact, an official dialogue with the government of the United States. We, of course, cannot decide which government is going to be in power in the United States at any given time, given moment in time. That is a matter for the people of the United States. We believe it is very, extremely important for us to maintain normal relations so we're able to conduct proper dialogue in a civilized fashion with whomever happens to be at power at a particular time. Applause. I wonder if that's a Reagan <laughs> job. <laughs> I wonder what that's about. The question of ideological differences, the question of different paths of social, economic, and political development, the question of geopolitical perspectives and a strategic consensus and whatnot, is really neither here nor there in the final analysis. The fact of the matter is, if there is no established mechanism for holding dialogue, then there is no basis on which relations can be maintained in an effective way. We believe it is in the interest of both the people of the United States and of Grenada to have normal relations between our governments. We believe it is important because too much is at stake here. Too many of our nationals live in this country and too many American citizens and students live in our country. There is a need for some kind of mechanism to be established. And that is why we have been struggling so hard to try to get some of our, the basic norms um, established. Let us exchange ambassadors, we have said. They have rejected that. So we have no ambassador accredited to Washington because they refuse to accept the credentials of the ambassador we have suggested. When they replaced their ambassador after electoral victory of the President Reagan in 1980 and the new ambassador came out in 1981, he was not accredited to Grenada. So we have to talk presumably using loudspeakers. <laughs> in 1981, on two occasions, I have wrote letters to President Reagan in March and again in August. The first letter, a short letter, made a simple, obvious point. Look, you are a new president. We had hoped that as new president, you would like to take a look at the situation, that you would be anxious to start off on a good relations as you can with all countries around the world. We had hope, therefore, that you would want relations normalized. And we went in on that letter to make the point that what we are saying is the bottom line, of, what we are saying is the true bottom line of the dialogue. It is talks. Therefore, let us get these talks going. We are proposing no agenda with any preconditions. Let us look at all the questions. Let us put them all on the table. Let us see what you perceive as problems, and we will tell you what we perceive as problems. Let us see if in the course of these discussions, we can narrow down differences, so at least the new beginning that is made will be on the basis of mutual understanding with less distrust and less suspicion. No reply to that letter. The second letter was August 1981, and this was a very strong letter, about 12 type pages. And the reason there were 12 type pages was not because there were 12 type pages talking about agenda. There were 12 type pages because by that time, the hostile, aggressive course of destabilization against our government by the Ronald Reagan administration had been well established. Do you want to say something? Ten? Oh, no. Yeah. Um, so the letter went into question of, um, so the letter went into the question of propaganda destabilization against us. It went into the question of the economic destabilization against us. We were able to speak about a discrimination that is exercised against banana farmers in our country. We were able to speak against um, about the attempt to offer money to the Korean Development Bank on the sole condition that Grenada be excluded. We were able to raise a number on these issues, including the fact that in April 1981, when we, um, when we had organized a co-financing conference to raise funds for our international airport project, the American administration sent their diplomats to European capitals trying to persuade members of countries of the EEC, the European Economic Community, not to attend that conference. We raised in that letter the question of military destabilization, which was already beginning. We pointed out that one well-known mercenary in, the, in April of 1981 had gone publicly on television in this country, admitting that he was training mercenaries in Miami for an invasion of our country. We said, how can you allow this in your country? 
there are international conventions against this kind of thing. And sending Marines directly to somebody's country is no less a sin than allowing mercenaries to be supplied, to be trained, and to have a logistical base on your own territory. So we raise all these points. Once again, we said we are willing to talk at whatever level is deemed appropriate. Let us make a start. Again, no reply. The fact is, sisters and brothers, we have had this long, long history of trying to see in what ways relations could be normalized. And we have had very little success in this regard. But I really wanna to say tonight that we do believe it is important for us to continue that struggle and therefore, notwithstanding the difficulties in the way, we deem it advisable to continue to press for a full normalization of relations. Again, he's talking about the relations between Grenada and America and uh, America's aggression and how Grenada has tried in every way to be accommodating and to avoid conflict and invasion, but America's already hell bent on it because again, a socialist revolution is a threat to capital and empire. But of course, as we press for normalization, we are also going to continue to build our revolution. We are also going to continue to consolidate our process. In the face of all the difficulties, in the face of the economic destabilization, the political, the diplomatic and military threats and pressure, we're going to stand on our feet and keep going forward. As you know, sisters and brothers, in these times, it is coming more and more difficult for developing third world countries to go forward because unfortunately our economies remain by and large dependent on and tied to the capitalist world economies and therefore when the capitalist world goes through their cyclical crisis one after the other it has an immediate effect on us as we say at home when the capitalist world catches a cold we catch pneumonia in the oecd organization for economic cooperation and development Crunchies, for example, it is estimated that over 35 million people in the 12 to 13 countries are out of jobs, 35 million. It is estimated that in the United States, there are perhaps 12 million people out of work. In Britain, perhaps 4 million people out of work. And in all of the developed industrialized countries, there is greater and greater unemployment. And as this unemployment goes deeper and deeper into the society, the people who feel it the most are the poor and the working people. Real quick, I just wanna point out that the, one of the reasons why I picked this speech to read is because I want us to hear from more revolutionaries and to see how knowledgeable they are, not just on the conditions of their country and their people, but how the knowledgeable they are about geopolitics and the conditions of people around the world and how necessary that is. Because as we talk to people about revolution and the need to overthrow an oppressive system, we have to be knowledgeable, not just about our conditions, but tying it together and connecting it. So he goes on to say, there are massive cuts in social welfare. The cuts are not coming in the arms race. The cuts are not coming out of the arms budget. I understand the talk is to spend $3 trillion over five years. The mind boggles. $3 trillion is not even $3 billion, which is $3,000 million, but it is $3,000 billion. And if you work out three tri I'm sorry, $3 trillion over five years, you will discover it comes down to a spending of $1.6 billion United States dollars a day. The arms are swallowing up the money. The people are not benefiting. This crisis in the capitalist world, moreover, has led to a situation where more and more of their countries, especially in 1982, experienced only negative growth. The effect this has, has had on us in turn has been to create a crisis in the developing world. It is now estimated that our debts exceed $650 billion, that is how much money we, are owed, we owe collectively. And it is not just the amount of money that is owed by one or two well-known cases like Mexico or Argentina, where you are talking about staggering debts of over $80 billion. But perhaps over 35 countries in the developing world now owe about $1 billion or more in debts in a context where they are still unable to create the necessary surpluses to repay the debts. Last year, $131 billion dollars was spent by the countries of the third world in just servicing their debt and just paying the interest. That's debt slavery, <laughs> it's sick. Last year too, the purchasing power of the countries of the third world fell again and fell very, very dramatically. It is estimated that over the last two years, third world developing countries lost $85 billion 
and purchasing power via the credits we lost, via the real price for our commodities because the prices keep falling and via high interest rates. But on top of that, we are also discovering that it is becoming more and more difficult to engage in trade with the countries of the Western industrialized world. The developing world as a whole in 1955 had 40% of total world trade. But by 1969, that figure had dropped to 25%. In other words, we lost 15% of the world market. Trade is also increasingly difficult for us because of the high tariff barriers. In reality, I'm sorry, the reality is that aid has also decreased quite dramatically for third world countries. Long ago, the United States, the United Nations set a target that all the developed industrialized countries should aim to provide as aid 0.7% of their gross national product. And so far as I know from the latest figures we've seen, not one single industrialized country has yet attained that target. Collectively, they are now giving only 0.45%, I'm sorry, point, yeah, 0.45% of the GNP as aid. In the old days, it was possible to supplement some of this through direct investment. In Latin America, about 40 years ago, 43% of all direct United Nations investments went into Latin America. But by the beginning of the 1970s, that 43% had dropped to 17%. More and more because of the influence of one or two countries, and in particular of one country, it is now becoming virtually impossible to get loans from the International Monetary Fund, IMF, or the World Bank. In fact, we know that there is a hit, last, a hit list which has been developed with countries like Grenada, Nicaragua, Angola, and Mozambique on it. Once any of these countries makes an application to the IMF, regardless of how good technically its program is, the instructions are to find all possible ways of blocking those sources of funding. They are forcing more and more third world countries to go directly to the international capital market, to the big commercial banks to get loans. First of all, you have to have what they call a credit rating. And to get a credit rating, you have to go to the same World Bank and IMF. Not everybody can get a credit rating. But even after you get a credit rating, you have to then deal with the question of very short repayment terms and very high interest rates. So basically, in this speech he's doing to the workers, he's painting a very vivid picture of the conditions that led to the need for a socialist revolution, that the capitalist system is literally choking out the global South on purpose for exploitation purposes and to expansion of white hegemony and power. And he's so he's he's laying that out. And this is a speech we're reading that Maurice Bishop did in New York to the U.S. workers. Uh, I'm going to continue. Um, and while all of this is going on, sisters and brothers, there are so many people in the world who are unemployed, so many people in the world who go into bed hungry every single night, so many millions in the third world who are literate and whose governments either do not care or feel they cannot do anything to solve that problem. Unemployment, hunger, malnutrition, disease, illiteracy, these are the crimes and the sins that are committed upon the poor developing countries of the third world, while the industrialized countries continue to exploit our resources and keep the profits. And then there's a pause in the audience. Consider what happens to the sweat of a banana farmer or a banana worker in Grenada. In Grenada, the particular transnational corporation we deal with what is one called Geest Industries. Mr. Von Geest was a man who came from Holland originally, went to England, and opened up a flower shop. Then he discovered there was more money in ships than in flowers. He eventually developed a monopoly of transporting bananas from many, many Caribbean countries to the English market. market. It works out that for every dollar that is obtained from the sale of bananas, the banana workers and banana farmers share 10 cents, and the other 90 cents goes to, in one form or another, to Mr. Van Geest and his type. 10 cents for all that labor and sweat. That will give us, um, give as good as an indication as possible of the inequality, inequalities, inequities and injustice in the system. And it's so wild. They're like, oh, 90%, you know, and 10% goes to the worker. We're at 1%. <laughs> and 99, so listen. But yet, brothers and sisters and brothers, in the face of all, um, in the 
face of all this, the Grenadian Revolution has nonetheless continued to go forward and to make progress. At a time when even the big, powerful, industrialized nations were going backwards last year, we grew forward by 5.5%. And coming out of the old history of negative development and retrogression under the former dictator Gary, when year after year it was backward growth, over the last four years of the revolution, cumulatively, we have grown by over 15%. The revolution in Grenada started from a base under Gary of 49% unemployment, one in every two people who wanted to work couldn't get a job, and among women, 70% unemployment, seven out of every 10 could not get a job. Therefore, at the dawn of a revolution, over 22,000 people who wanted to work could not find work. When we did a census last year, April 1982, the unemployment rate had dropped from 49% to 14.2%. Applause, rightfully so. In the days of Hurricane Gary, those 29 years of economic, political, social, and spiritual devastation of our country and our people, there was no such thing as a plan. There was no such thing as a capital investment program, partly because Gary was a mystic and therefore he didn't have a plan but also partly because he was so corrupt that nobody was willing in any event to put 10 cents in his hand unless they send, <laughs> send down 10 police to check what's happening to the 10 cents. So in those days, we had nothing called a public investment program. And when it got going, it was the basis of a very small feasible advances. The last year of Gary, 1978, the capital investment program was 8 million. The first year of the revolution, that figure was doubled to 16 million. The second year of revolution, it was more than doubled again to 39.9 um, million, basically 40 million. The experts were saying that this is impossible. You don't have enough resources. You don't have enough management. You don't have enough tractors. You don't have any trucks. You don't have enough engineers. You can't possibly do it. You are only lucky in 1979 when you doubled Gary's. And you are only lucky in 1980, again, when you doubled your own. And then when we went in 1981, we doubled it again. And they say, we know you has the luck, but something is wrong. And the last year in 1982, it went up to over 100 million. And then we gave them the secret. We told them that in the revolution, things operate differently than in a normal situation. There's a pause. We have been able to make these accomplishments because in Grenada, consistent with our three pillars of the revolution, where the first pillar is our people, is our people who are always at the center and heart and focus of all of our activities. We are able to mobilize and organize people to cut out waste, to cut corruption, to stamp out inefficiency, to move planning, to look for, out for production, to check on productivity, to make sure that state enterprises are not set up to be subsidized, but that state enterprises too must become, become viable must make a profit, and therefore the state sector will have to, the surplus to bring the benefits. Our people have gladly been pulled into an economic, into the economic process because our people see the benefits which the revolution has brought them. They understand that when 37 cents out of every dollar is spent on health and education, that means something. They look around, they understand that year after year, inflation is being reasonably held reasonably in check Last year, it ran at 7% while wages ran at 10%, thus ensuring an overall increase of 3% in the standard of living of all our people. They look around and recognize that year after year, production increases. Last year in the state sector, production went up by 34%, and in the private sector, production also rose. Last year, too, there was a tremendous rise in the export of non-traditional products. The increase in the exports of fruits and vegetables last year went up by over 314%, which is a massive increase in a short period. There are also increases in production in areas like flour and clothing, and there was a slight decrease in the area of furniture. At the same time, there were increases in the area of our traditional crop export crops, nutmegs, cocoa, and bananas. Though in the case of nutmegs, there has been a tremendous problem in our country has had to face a great difficulty in obtaining sales from the nut mix. You could, I'll buy some. Hello? Uh, can y'all hear me? If I can get a thumbs up, if people can hear me in the space. 
Okay. Can y'all hear Chews? Okay, so I can't hear anything at all. Okay, real quick, because now I'm confused. <laughs> Is Chews talking right now? No? All right, hold on. Let me see. I got to fix something because I can't hear anything. All right, I'm seeing thumbs down. So hold on real quick. I don't know what happened. Choose, you might have to drop and come back. But okay, real quick, uh, the consensus in the room. Can y'all show a thumbs up emoji if y'all can hear me? Can anybody hear me? All right, cool, I see the emojis now. So Choose is gonna be connecting and coming back. I, there was some kind of glitch. Oh, appreciate y'all. Thank you. Because I thought I was going to have to end the space. So this space is going to be a little longer than an hour because this is a very short like pamphlet. It was like a dollar I found somewhere. So we're going to read the whole thing. So if that's okay with y'all, I would really like to keep that going. I'm going to wait for Choose to come back. And that way we can keep reading. Here, let me see if I have to invite her. Cause I don't even see her in the space anymore. She might have to restart the app or something. While we wait, I'm gonna go ahead cause she'll probably text me and let me know that she's back in the space. I'm gonna keep reading. Uh, let's see, 300. At the same time, there were some increases in the area of traditional export crops, nutmegs, cocoa, and bananas. Though in this case of nutmegs, there has been a tremendous problem. Our country has had to face a great difficulty in obtaining sales of the nutmegs. When you're producing something like nutmegs, which is really meant primarily as a spicy flavor for foods. And when there is a crisis or a recession or whatever, the fancy name we use, then people stop putting the spices in the food and therefore your nutmegs accumulate. So real quick, what he just did is a compare and contrast. He talked about what the conditions were under a capitalist imperialist uh, hand in the, in over Grenada. And then what happened when the people liberated themselves and the improvement of the material conditions. Again, the reason why America saw Grenada in its socialist revolution, black so <laughs> socialist, sorry, y'all, that was my ice machine, <laughs> black socialist revolution as a threat is because it, it clears that facade that America tries to sell and indoctrinates its academic class to, to spew to us that somehow capitalism has risen people out of poverty when it's actually the opposite. And so what happens is when you have a successful socialist revolution like Grenada had created and fought for and maintained and their, their material conditions kept increasing exponentially, well, then that is a direct threat. And what happened, what they were worried about at the time is that they were worried about black people in the United States seeing this. Because again, there was many Grenadans in America at the time. So there was that link. So Black Americans were very aware of what was happening in Grenada and how they were able to get liberation and what that looked like. So they were afraid that Black Americans would adopt and fight for a socialist revolution at home in the, in, in the belly of the beast. And that's why, in the empire's eyes, Grenada had to be suppressed. Uh, let me check to see if Chews is back. I still don't see her. Hold on right quick, y'all. I just want to invite her real quick. Mm -mm -mm. Hope the space isn't glitching too bad. Let me find her. Okay, I'm not sure. She's not online anymore, so I guess I'm gonna thug it out. <laughs> I, you know what? Let me text her right quick to see what's happening. Sorry, y'all, just a quick pause. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and pick up, and I'm on page 16. Again, this is a continuation of Maurice Bishop's speech to U.S. workers in New York. But our people in Grenada are not only able to see these economic achievements in the broad terms in which I have described them, but they are able to feel what these benefits mean to them in a concrete and material way. Because today, the money that the people of Grenada used, they no longer have to spend. Oh, okay. 
uh, chooses phone died. So unfortunately, we won't have a co-host. So I'm going to just thug it through the rest of the speech until their phone charges. But our people in Grenada are not only able to see these economic achievements in the broad terms in which I have described them, but they are able to feel what these benefits mean to them in a concrete and material way. Because today, the money... Oh, okay, hold on. I think they're back. Let me see. Okay, yeah. Let me invite back to co-host. I choose. I just threw your co-host. And I'm going to keep reading. And... I'm going to let you know where I'm at. So basically, I just finished that last paragraph, and I'm on page 16, and I'm reading for the first paragraph. So I'm still on my page, so you didn't miss much. Period. Sorry, y'all. Y'all know my executive functioning is basura. So yeah. <laughs> but our people in Grenada are not only able to see these economic achievements in broad terms in which I've described them, but... They are able to feel what these benefits mean in them in a concrete and material way. Because today, the money that the people Grenada used to have to spend, for example, when they went to a doctor or a dentist, they no longer have to spend because they now have free health care. They now understand that in a number of doctors in the country has more than doubled, moving from a ratio of one doctor to every 4,000 before the revolution to the present ratio of one doctor for every 2,700 of, of our population. Moving from a situation before the revolution where there was just one dental clinic for the whole country, today, there are seven dental clinics, including one for our offshore islands of Caraco and Petite Martinique. Our people understand the value and the benefits of free secondary education because they know now that once their children are able to pass a common entrance exam, and get into secondary schools, they no longer have to worry about finding those fees, which for agricultural workers, for example, was very often impossible. But not just free secondary education, but in effect, free university education. Moving from a situation before the revolution where in the last year of Gary, just three people went abroad on university scholarship and they happened to include Gary's daughter, another minister's daughter. We moved from that situation to the first six months of the revolution. When 106, I'm sorry, 109 students went abroad on free university scholarship. Our people are more and more getting to understand what we mean when we say that education to us is liberation, that education is a strategic concern for this government. That is why this year is the year we have named the year of political and academic education. We understand the importance of bringing education to our people of raising their consciousness, of promoting worker education classes in the workplace, and at the same time, giving them an ac academic education, providing them with skills, training, ensuring that those who are not able to read and to write are now able to do so. Following the establishment of the Center for Popular Education, CPE, program in early eight, 1980, within one year, the literacy figure in Grenada was reduced to 2% of the entire population. And UNESCO, the United Nations body dealing with education, says if you have less than 5% illiteracy, you do not have an illiteracy problem. The fact is that while illiteracy has now been removed, there is still a serious problem of functional literacy. And therefore, the second phase of the CPE program has started. In this phase of adult education, which our people at home call the night schools, for two nights a week, three hours each, in other words, six hours a week, agricultural workers, farmers in our country, clerical workers, factory workers, unemployed youth who have dropped out of school, more and more of them are now going to one of the 72 centers operating around the country, bringing this night school education to our people. I really want the sisters and brothers to understand just how difficult this task is. If you can reflect back, on the normal daily habits of the average agricultural worker throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, and to a great extent still today, we are to be frank and honest. We understand how difficult it is to run an adult education program. The average agric agricultural worker goes to work early in the morning, goes home in the afternoon, does a little back gardening, then maybe heads to the rum shop to play some dominoes or sit down to talk with the partners. To ask such an agricultural worker now to come out twice a week to a night school and for three hours to sit down and go through a formal education course is really asking a lot. 
during the very first experience we had with the literacy phase in 1980. I remember holding several meetings from time to time with the CPE mobilizers and CPE educators. And over and over again, those comrades would say that the problem is you cannot persuade the sisters and brothers to be consistent. Some nights when they're reaching a house and they knock on the door and they say, where's your husband? She say, not here. And when you look under the bed, you see the man hiding. In other words, it is a very difficult task, but it is a task we are trying to accomplish. What is the background and tradition we have had? It is a background and tradition that has, generally speaking, worshipped materialism. It is a background and tradition that has meant that because of the ravages of colonialism, our people have always seen themselves as transients. Our people have always had a visa mentality. And the whole point was to catch the next boat or plane to go abroad. Coming out of the colonial experience and fed daily all of the rubbish that we are fed through the newspapers, the radios, the television, where they are proclaiming the virtues of materialism, where they are proclaiming the importance of every single person having a video and having the latest kind of radio not only came out six months ago, not to mention the newest kind of shampoo. That kind of thing feeds consumerism, feeds ec economism, and helps to hold a society back. In our country, many people have, as a sole aspiration, the need to have a motor car. The fact that a motor car means foreign exchange earnings to have to go out because we don't produce motor cars that it means that more money has to be spent on gas. These things are not so easily explainable because of the political education that is daily taking place through the imperialist media. The reason the people of Vietnam are quite content and happy that virtually every citizen can ride around Vietnam on a bicycle is in part because they have not been exposed to the corrupt and decadent values. But if we ask our people to take up a bicycle instead, of course, that is a problem. In Grenada, it's a double problem because Grenada is one big mountain and bicycles really can't work. Ooh, chow. Imagine taking a bicycle throughout Grenada, how big your cheeks would get. Mm, you'd be caked up on a Tuesday afternoon. Let me stop. Um, Ten, it's been an hour. Do you want to No, we were saying that we were going to get through the book. It's not long. Hello? Is she yeah, talking? No, sorry. It just I don't know why it muted me. But okay. Um but our people in Grenada are not only able to see these economic achievements in the broad terms in which I have described them, but they are able to feel what these benefits mean to them in a concrete and material way. Because today the money that the people of Grenada used to have to spend, for example, when they went to see a doctor or a dentist, they no longer have to spend because now they have free health care. They now understand that the number of doctors in the country has more than doubled, moving from the ratio of one doctor to every 4,000 before the revolution to the present ratio. Wait, yo, choose, what page are you on? Oh my God, did my thing move? Yeah, so we read that one already. You're on page 18, at the bottom of say 18, I was and like, it starts there. Okay, cool, thank you. But the point I'm making, yeah, that's it. Okay. But the point I'm making, sisters and brothers, is the nature of the struggle that we have un um, underg undergone, not only to raise the production and pro productivity, but to instill new values in our people. As we struggle on the road towards creating a new man and a new woman living in a new life and what we know will be a new civilization, the old culture, the old habits, the old prejudices are always there struggling against the shoots of the new. That is a struggle that we have resolutely waged every single day of our lives. But it is much easier for our people to make those sacrifices. It is much easier for them to accept the importance of these things, which they have not been in the habit of doing, because now they know that for the first time, material benefits are coming. Our people now understand that what they put out will come back, whether through free health care or free education or the number of jobs created. With the free milk distribution program in our country last year, a small island like Grenada, 73,000 pounds of milk were distributed free every single month to over 50,000 people, nearly half of the population. Last year too, under the house repair program in our country, over 17,240 individuals benefited. 
Under this program, the poorest workers in our country are entitled to a loan to repair the houses, to fix the roofs, to fix the floors, to make sure that rain does not fall on the child while he's trying to study. And after the materials are given to the worker, the worker then repays over six years at a rate of $5 a month out of his wages. If he had gone to a bank and knocked, let us say, on the door of Mr. Barclays, the first thing Mr. Barclays would ask him is, where's your collateral? And maybe if he understands that big word, he puts out his cutlass and says, look, no collateral. But even if he got past that word and was able to find some collateral somehow or the other, there is still another hurdle that he would have to go over because then he discovers that a loan could only be for over, could only be for over one year. And a thousand dollar loan at 12.5% interest over 12 months would mean a monthly repayment of over $88 a month. That means that just no, that just about no agriculture worker would have been able to afford it. And that is why today the agriculture workers understand what the revolution is about because they have felt the weight of the revolution. The people understand that in all areas of their basic needs, attempts are being made to solve these problems. Um, two and a half million gallons more of water, pipe-borne water, are flowing into the homes of Canadians at this time. Before the revolution, in many homes and in many parts of the country, pipes had actually rusted up because water had not passed there for years. The pipes just stayed there and corroded. The people understand what it means when electrification is brought to their village. The people understand what it means when they know by the middle of next year, we will have doubled the electricity output and capacity in our country. And therefore more people will have the possibility of using electricity. 30% of the lowest paid workers in our country no longer pay any income tax at all. Oh my God, that's so, so beautiful. These workers take home all their money. Old aid pensioners had their pension increase by 10% last year and this year it is going up by 12.5%. Our people know that last year, some 43 million were spent on the International Airport Project alone, and another 40 million will be spent on that project this year again. They know that last year, over 49 miles of feeder roads were built, feeder roads being the roads that connect the farmers to the main roads. So now the produce can be brought out safely. They know that apart from the 49 miles of feeder roads, the 15 miles of farm roads were built and 14 new miles of main roads were also built, totaling therefore something like 78 new miles of roads in our country last year alone. Our people therefore have got a greater and deeper understanding of what the revolution means and what it has brought to them. They certainly understand very, very clearly that when some people attack us on the grounds of human rights, when some people attack us on the grounds of constituting a threat to national security of other countries, our people understand that this is foolishness. They know the real value has to do with the fact of the revolution and the benefits that the revolution is bringing to the people of our country. The real reason for all this hostility is because some perceive what is happening in Grenada can lay the basis for a new socioeconomic and political path of development. They give all kinds of reasons and excuses, some of them credible, some of them utter rubbish. We saw an interesting one recently in a secret report to the State Department. I want to tell you about that one so you can reflect on it. The secret report made this point, that the Grenada Revolution is in one sense even worse, and I'm using their language, than the Cuban and Nicaraguan revolutions because the people of Grenada and the leadership of Grenada speak English and therefore can communicate directly with the people of the United States. Applause is in the speech. I can see from your applause, sisters and brothers, that you agree with that report. But I want to tell you what the same report said that also made us very dangerous. That is the people of Grenada and the leadership of Grenada are predominantly black. More applause. They said that 95% of our population is black and they had to correct that, and they had the correct statistic and if we have 95% of predominantly African origin in our country, then we can have a dangerous appeal to 30 million Black people in the United States. More applause. Now, that aspect of the report clearly is one of the most sensible. So, yeah, that is one of the reasons why I like reading this. Is One thing is that oftentimes we talk about what does a socialist revolution look like. And here he lays out all the points in which we're improved and how they were improved and by what that looked like in comparison to being under a capitalist imperialist rule. 
And we saw that the conditions improved not only drastically, but damn nearly right away. And that the people were committed to working to make these improvements because they saw they saw theory put to action. And then that's dangerous because it's one thing to sit on a podium and pontificate all day and be able to say these beautiful words and this rhetoric and this theory over and over. It's another thing to apply that theory and put it into practice and actually see a solution, especially if it's a socialist revolution. That is why Grenada was so dangerous and why they did everything to suppress it. And again, like Maurice Bishop said and what co-host Shoes just read, is that, again, this was a predominantly Black country. So that's a challenge to white supremacy and a challenge to capitalism and, again, a challenge to imperialism. And they got their, they got their socialist revolution underway and improved their material conditions. And, again, because there was such a huge Grenadian population in the United States at the time, Black Americans were very aware of what was happening and watching it in real time and becoming, again, motivated for revolution here at home. And the government can't have that shit. But sisters and brothers, how do we evaluate other sides of the report? Like when they say that Grenada violates human rights, when they say to us, how come you have detainees? What about the press? What about elections? When they say to us, where are your elections? They don't turn around at the same time and say to their friends in South Africa, where are your elections? Applause. When they say to us that elections must be held, and if you don't have elections, you can't export support, expect support. And unless you have elections, we can't give you the normal treatment. We say Salvador Allende of Chile, another applause. Salvador Allende of Chile was elected in September 1970 by the people of Chile. Allende did, uh, did not take power through a revolution. Within 24 hours of his election, Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, and Richard Helms sat down and devised their plan, Operation Make the Economy Scream, and even in the first three months after Linde was elected, before he was inaugurated as president, they already tried to kill Linde once. They couldn't even wait for him to be formally inaugurated. Linde did not form a militia. Linde did not grab any land or property. Linde had no political de detainees. Allende did not crush the press. He did not close down the parliament. He did not suspend the constitution. He played by every rule they wrote, but they killed him still. So it's important. And again, it's so on time because I think that this is a good, uh, a good speech to read, especially after our previous readings. I feel like it ties it all together. So if you go back and you revisit uh, some of the previous spaces of the audiobooks. You'll see why I chose this one now. It just ties everything perfectly together, but then also, too, we can draw direct parallels of what's happening in current day across the global south. Uh, okay. Especially with uh, the part about um, how they use propaganda to paint these people as, oh, they're not having fair elections, so America, being the bastion of democracy, has to intervene. And again, he's pointing out the hypocrisy, like, you're full of shit. That's not what this is about. Uh, let's see. Alinde did not form a militia. Alinde did not grab any blood. Sorry. These people understand very well that a revolution means a new situation. A revolution implies a fracture. It implies a break with the past. It implies disruption of a temporary character. Revolution means that the abuses and excesses of the violent, reactionary, and disruptive minority have to be crushed so that the majority's interests can prevail. Applause. No revolution that does not have a dislocation can be located, I'm sorry, cannot be called revolution. That is an impossibility. When the British had their revolution in the, 19, in the 1650s, it took them 200 years to call their first election. When the Americans had their revolution in 1776, it took them 13 years to call their election. In the first week of the American Revolution, 100,000 fled to Canada. Thousands were locked up without charge or trial. Hundreds were shot. And the counter-revolutionaries after the American Revolution had no right to vote. They had no right to teach. They had no right to preach. They had no right to a job. Their land was confiscated without payment. So when the falsifiers of history tried to pretend that the American Revolution was a Boston Tea Party, it was a very bloody tea party. So there's a book by one of my favorite people and one of the most people, important people of our time, in my opinion, Gerald Horn. There's a book called The Counter-Revolution of 1776. And we're going to do a space on that because 
it is so such important work. The fact of the matter is, sisters and brothers, if we are to be honest about this question, whenever revolution comes, the same questions face the leaders of the revolution. One question always is, what do you do with the bloody minded murderers, the criminals, the ones who propped up the dictatorship, the ones who led to disappearances of our people, the ones who were beating the people, who were killing the people? Revolutions answer that question in different ways. Some people take them out in the streets, line them up and shoot them down. That is one answer. Some other people pretend that they went into the bush and while they were in the bush as guerrillas, they shoot them down too. Some other people create special courts to deal with them. I am not passing judgment on any of these three models. The Grenada revolution did not have the appetite for any of those three models. So we took what we say was the humanitarian course we detained them and treated them well. And you know, it is highly significant that of the 400 to 500 people picked up by our masses on Revolution Day on the 13th of March, not one of these mongoose gang elements arrived in jail with even a scratch on them. And the only reason that happened is because our people at home understand the principled position that a revolution takes on no revenge, no victimization, no torture, no ill treatment of anyone, regardless of what they have done. It is because our people understood this, something that very often happens in all revolutions. The spontaneous upheaval of the masses did not really happen in Grenada. A church-based organization in Washington called Epica, E-P-I-C-A, wrote a book last year on Grenada. They called it Grenada, the Peaceful Revolution. We can understand why. So when these elements come and make these statements, we understand only too well where they are coming from because they understand that the processes and procedures for review are ongoing procedures. They understand that in Grenada, no one is ever interfered with for what he says. No one is ever interfered with for what he writes. In fact, today, criticism is deeper than ever in the society in a constructive way. Our people also understand that the first law of revolution is that a revolution must survive, must consolidate, so more benefits can come to them. And because of this, in fact, the revolution has laid down as a law that nobody, regardless of who you are, will be allowed to be involved in any activity surrounding the overthrow of the government by the use of armed violence. And anyone who moves in that direction will be ruthlessly crushed. There's an applause. But we also feel, sisters and brothers, that the time has come for us to make another step along the way toward institutionalizing the process that we have been building for four years. And that is, while only yesterday in Grenada, the new chairman of the Constitutional Commission arrived in our capital city, St. George's, from Trinidad and Tobago, to announce the formation of the Constitutional Commission that has now undertaken the task of drafting a new constitution for our young revolution. This constitution is not really going to look like the one that the Queen gave us in 1974. That constitution, as we remember, was one of the main reasons for the struggles of 73 and 74, when so many of us were beaten and jailed, when our families and compatriots were being murdered. One of the main reasons for the, that struggle was because our people were saying we wanted to be involved in the process of drafting the new constitution. And Gary did not allow us that right. And the Queen of England could have stayed in the Buckingham Palace, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and posted it to Gary. That was the total involvement of Grenada in that constitution. This time around, the constitution is going to come out of the bowels of our people and out of our earth. Our people will have their input and they will decide what they want to see to go they what they want to see to go into that constitution. This time around, the constitution will not just entrench empty rights would entrench rights and also provide remedies for enforcement of those rights. Chapter one of our present constitution has 12 freedoms, fundamental freedoms. But anytime those rights are infringed and you go before the courts to see if there's anything you can do about that, first of all, you can only go by way of a constitutional motion. Secondly, that means you can only go in the high court, not the magistrate's court, which of course means money. And thirdly, when you reach the high court, even if the judge agrees with you and you win your case, the most the judge can give you is what they call a declaratory order, which declares your rights. Now, when you bring your declaratory order to the government, you then discover another maxim of the law. You cannot enforce against the crown. In other words, you have paper judgment in your hands that you can do nothing with. We are going to want 
to put rights in the, to the Constitution, rights which can be enforced in a way that the people can themselves manage, and rights which, once the remedies are provided, will in fact be allowed by our government, a Constitution with real teeth. Our new constitution is also certainly going to institutionalize and entrench the systems of popular democracy, which have been building over the last four, four years in our country. Apart from the usual nation, national elections, which will of course be there too, we are going to ensure these embryonic organs of popular democracy continue to have a place. Because to us, democracy is much, much more than just an election. To us, democracy is a great deal more than just the right to put X next to Tweedledum or Tweedledee every five years. The sec second principle of democracy for us is responsibilities. So the elected officials must at all times ensure that the mandate they are carrying out, if mandate it is, is a mandate the people want. And part of that responsibility means the right to recall those we, re elect, we elect must be entrenched. We don't believe in Grenada in we don't believe in Grenada in presidents for life or electing people for life. We believe in service for life. When you stop serving, you must be recalled to get out of the way for somebody else to serve. The third principle of democracy is participating mechanisms, popular participation. We accept the well-known definition of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln said of democracy that it is the government of, for, and by the people. I accept that. It's a good definition. But if, it, but if it is government of, for, and by the people, then it can't not just be government of the people you elect. It also has to be for the people and has to be by them. They have to have a way of participating. That is what the word by means. If that is absent, then you don't really have a democracy. So we are saying we need to have mechanisms that ensure the people have a way of giving expression to their own feelings and concerns. And some of the more developed industrialized countries that have had hundreds of years to build democracy, a number of things have developed that are perhaps helpful. Some of them have genuinely free and responsible press. Some of them genuinely allow all sections to express their views. Some of them have very effective lobbies where virtually every interest in society can find their way to get their matter raised in Congress or Parliament. Some of them, of course, have highly literate people and highly developed political opinion of people who can interpret for themselves to some extent. One form or of uh, sorry, one form or the other of democracy may or may not be correct in those situations. Westminster parliamentary democracy, let us say, may be well acceptable to the people of England. I cannot speak to that, but I know that for the people of Grenada at this stage in our history, Westminster. Westminster parliamentary democracy is really Westminster parliamentary hypocrisy. Ooh, that sounded like a bar. I don't know what he's talking about, but it sounded lit. And then there was a pause after that, so it must have been lit. We believe that it's very important for the people to have a voice in running their affairs. One way is the creation of mass, organized, mass organizations of our people, the National Women's Organization, the National Youth Organization, the Farmers Union, and of course, the labor unions. Before the revolution, Gary had passed the law in 1978, the Essential Services Act, which took away the right to strike from the workers of our country. We not only repealed that law, but instead we passed a new law, Recognition of Trade Unions Law, which any time in the workplace, 51% of workers indicate that they want to form a, or join a union of their choice, that union must be recognized by the employer. Not only were the women of the country without work before the revolution, the women in our country were also the most harassed and victimized of any section of our population. Those few who were granted jobs from time to time, many of them were given those jobs only on the basis of a sexual favor. Our women, will be, our women were being sexually exploited in return for jobs. In the very first decree of the revolution was to outlaw sexual victimization and exploitation of women in return for jobs. Applause. And people will tell you that gender is a secondary issue, but here we go. The very first decree of the revolution is about the rights of women. Hmm. And going on from that, sisters and brothers, the revolution then passed a law which applied to all workers in the public sector of equal pay for and equal work for all women. We also then passed another law, more recently, a maternity leave law. And by this maternity leave law, every woman who is pregnant must be granted three months maternity leave, two months full pay, and one could be without full pay, and a guarantee of return to employment after the pregnancy. So I know I said before that we were going to go ahead and get through it, but 
you know, I want to hear or see what the co-host and also what the people and the listeners, if you want us to continue, there's about maybe 10, a little over 10 more pages. If you like, if you think it's a good stopping point and you can kind of sit with what's been said again, it's a lot. And I encourage people to read the PDF It's very short, but he brings up things that we should be thinking about on what, you know, changing our material conditions look like. And also like choose was saying, Compare it to how people talk today about what liberation looks like. Oftentimes people will tell us like, oh, you know, let's just put black first and everything else comes secondary. Or let's just put this one group first, let's put class first and white supremacy comes secondary. It's like, no, that's not how this works. And again, we see it in real time and we see what happens when we actually approach this on a principled level. And again, in a constructive way, it actually changes the material conditions of the people and it's a true socialist revolution. And I also want to say too, that it's very important especially as black colonized people that we use examples of black revolution like oftentimes i'll hear people uh use examples of conditions that we want to emulate and they'll go to a nordic country or some other casper uh, cousins country and it's like why when you as african people people of african descent have many different examples that we can literally relate to and apply today and it's very important to do so because if your liberation is white i'm telling you we will not get out this oppressive system we have our own examples we can use them and they're very valuable and we could build upon those and we need to make that a common practice. So I guess I'll refer to the co-host first. Like, do you think this is a good stopping point? And then we'll, we could pick this up tomorrow and finish it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love it for exactly that point. Right. Because oftentimes people are like, oh, you know, we legislate this one piece at a time. If we do this one little increment, you know, and they're very clearly outlining what happens when the people form a critical mass and just take the shit. Everybody could just get what they need ASAP. And it's just beautiful to me. So, yeah, I'm OK with this being a stopping point. But I really like how um, you chose this particular piece after everything that we've read, because I feel like it's giving us a very tangible look on like what it looks like for black people to have revolution in their countries in a country like Grenada, which I don't know much about the history there. So I really appreciate like just reading this with you all and like kind of just learning things that I didn't really know about and seeing also the parallels, because these motherfuckers said they revolted because 90% of each dollar was going to the CEO's baby. The conditions now are way worse than that. And people are still talking about, oh, let's let's tiptoe toe around the Democratic Party to get free. No, baby. Like, people have revolted for worse. People have taken power over their resources, how to work a revolutions for worse conditions. So now I'm just chatting. <laughs> But yeah, this is a good stopping point. If someone has something to add, um, this is a good, really good reading. Thank you, Penn. If you have something to add, you could ask um, to join the speaker. But other than that, um, I hope y'all are having a good Saturday night. Y'all are comfortable in your homes. Some are safe. And if not, you know, I'm sending my love to you. And I'm glad that you could find some community with us here tonight. So with that, I guess I'll go ahead and end the space, but I also too want to encourage people that after we have these spaces, including like, you know, the co-host or anybody listening, y'all can open up follow up spaces and have discussions that people might be more comfortable talking on a space that's not recorded or just, you know, just to have a follow up space for the days that I might not be able to have discussions. I encourage it. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And again, if y'all do, just send me the space so I can listen like a podcast too. Because listening to y'all dialogue about these things also helps expand my consciousness. I take, when I think about, you know, the saying that we're not free unless we're all free, I think that also includes that each of us has something to contribute to our collective consciousness and us shifting it and expanding it. So that means that I can't get to that next level of thinking unless I do so in a communal way, which means I have to listen and understand and get critique from the people around me that are principled. And that will help me to, again, formulate those uh, solutions that we're looking for to, so that we can change our material conditions. So again, choose. I don't know if you want to have a follow up space or if anyone wants to, I encourage it because I know I'm not going to be able to do discussion long tonight, but I'm glad y'all came. I'm very appreciative of all of us and the work we put into these spaces because y'all have shared them and they have grown and we've heard from so many great minds and I believe we're going to hear from a lot more as we go deeper into radical material. Again, one of the things I want to see and what I'm going to bring to these spaces is books, works, and speeches and essays of actual revolution and what it looks like. So we don't, it's not just theory. 
We can also look at the theory, but then the examples of when theory was put into action. And that gives us a more tangible understanding that not only is liberation possible, but a better world is attainable. So with that, I'll end it. Unless, choose you want to add anything else? Now you woke it up. I appreciate you. Hope everybody has a really, really good night, and we'll see y'all soon. All right, y'all. Let's get free.